Good morning, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this session of the conference. We're going to be talking about uh, Parkinson's disease and deep brain stimulation. I am Dr. Jill Farmer. I'm the director of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Program, and I have with me my colleague, Dr. Adam Sarkar. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, so I think today's session is going to be extremely exciting, and in a way, uh, part of the excitement is about the uh, communication and coordination that is going to happen. Even though my slide just says that we're talking about Parkinson's disease and deep brain stimulation, uh, it takes a literal village of uh, practitioners to get our patients uh, to the operating room. Yesterday when we did the spine uh, talk, it's clear that any one of the neurosurgeons could evaluate a patient and take them to the operating room. But I think the most amazing thing about deep brain stimulation surgery is the fact that it takes such coordination mm -hmm. from neurologists, neuropsychiatrists, and, uh, and from neurosurgeons. And I think that this is a talk that's going to highlight some aspects of that and certainly uh, your expertise in getting the patients to me. Um, I think we can go to our next slide because the next slide really fundamentally shows what's going to happen in a surgery. And I think that even though this might be a little bit of jumping the gun, I think what it does is it really sets up the problem, it sets up the place, which is the operating room, and it shows you the solution, which is really quite dramatic. And we'll roll this and there will be some audio here too. And this is a patient that we have in one of our operating rooms and you can see that his hands are being held not just for support and comfort but really because when we let go of his hands something's going to happen that I think all of Jill your patients will be very familiar with uh, and that's going to be I think quite dramatic and it's something that everyone that has any type of movement disorder will understand that the loss of ability to do what you want, like for instance, just simply sign your name, mm -hmm. is robbed Being from you. Eat, Absolutely. Name, put on makeup. Absolutely. And what we do in the operating room, I think is nothing short of magic. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's magic because I can't really exactly explain it, but it's not, it's, it's not just, um, it's just not dogma. And here you can see a little bit of electricity in the right part of the brain creates this amazing effect. This fellow could not use a cup, at least not a regular cup. He could use a sippy cup. He'd have to use two hands to drink. And I think when you're beyond the age of uh, five, you sort of find that sippy cups are probably no longer appealing. And you can see that when we use electricity, we can take away the effect or when we stop the electricity, we can take away the effect and we can just as easily uh, give him back the effect, which for him, uh, people cry in the operating room. Uh, it's, it's, and they probably cry when they come to you for programming. Mm -hmm. And so in this uh, continued part of our video, he's talking to his wife and he has not used an iPhone or a phone of any sort for years because there just never was an opportunity for him to do that. I think that's an amazing video because I think what it shows is the type of patient that is appropriate for DBS, but it's not the only type of patient that's appropriate for DBS. Uh, he is what we would call tremor predominant, and if someone presents with that symptom, uh, regardless of where they are in their clinical course of Parkinson's disease, I'm always going to be talking to them about DBS because it's that important. Research has shown that sooner rather than later stimulation, there's the early STEM study. Uh, patients have a better overall symptomatic course and quality of life um, if we intervene sooner rather than later. So we wanted to show that earlier because we one, everybody is curious about and fascinated by the mechanics of DBS and what it can do, and it's such a dramatic picture seeing that tremor get reduced um, when we are applying the stimulation. But because as with clinical practice, we want to talk about it and get it into patients' minds earlier because Absolutely. that is how we know we're going to affect the most change. And during the course of the conversation today, we'll talk about all the different types of patients that are appropriate for DBS and why we would refer them. But classically speaking, tremor predominant is definitely uh, the one that is the most dramatic and, and, and the one that can show that 
light switch type of effect. It is the most dramatic, but there are also many Parkinson's patients that you clearly take care of all the time that have the rigidity. Yes. And those folks, I feel, they suffer some grave consequences from not being able to be fluid. Mm -hmm. They can fall, they can break a hip, they can do things like that. And I think that maybe speak to the audience about how you feel those patients are with regard to their candidacy for surgery as well. Sure. So one of the classic um, uh, parameters when we look for for determining if the patient is good for DBS is their response to medication because the purpose of this is to elongate your best on time. Yeah. But everyone's on time is a little bit different. And for a non-tremor predominant patient, the akinetic, rigid, stiff patient, they might not have that robust response or big change that they can see when they have their medication. But you know that it is doing something because if meds are lowered or if doses are missed, they can tell there's a difference and they become more stiff. So these patients are also someone to consider because they have a response. And sometimes the medicines, even with all the newer medicines that are becoming available and the frequency of dosing and different strategies of getting that into the system, they're not getting that improvement of symptoms as much as they would like. Um, DBS is continuous. It provides continuous stimulation. And if we know that they have a responsiveness to medication, we can look to suggesting a surgical intervention because it's not just one surgical intervention for all. There's different targets. Um, and for patients that have that are tremor predominant, we look to the STN, but for the rigid uh, dystonic type patient, we might look more for the GPI. Mm -hmm. And our programming parameters are different then. Um, we use this in combination with meds still. Um, it doesn't mean that you come off medicines completely, but it is another option for patients that clinically fit a type of Parkinson's that we know, tremor predominant, akinetic rigid, or postural instability gait predominant are the three main umbrellas of uh, Parkinson's presentations. And for the, the first two, um, tremor predominant or akinetic rigid, we know that DBS can be more helpful um, than just medication alone. Uh, that's right. And I, I think that that's a really important point because I think that that's where our uh, communication and relationship is critical because I always tell patients that feel that they're going to go off of their meds that that's not going to be the case. Right. Mm -hmm. Dr. Farmer is going to wean your meds, mm -hmm. but the likelihood is that they'll never be medication right. free. Mm -hmm. There are some p patients that have gotten mm -hmm. that effect, but I think to sell that I think is uh, m m would be misguiding them and misleading them. Yes. But I think all the patients that I've seen in at least the 20 years that I've been doing this, when you select appropriately, mm -hmm. it really is truly like a home run. They are just so happy. And that is a key point because we sort of skew the results in our favor in that regard because you're not sending a patient for surgery no. unless you think they are going to have a good outcome. Um, and that process is multi-stepped. So it's getting an evaluation by a specialist, um, determining if the movement disorder specialist feels that they are a good candidate um, for DBS based on their clinical symptoms, the meds they've been using, and just the history that they've had, uh, but also getting a team involved uh, in order to get uh, cognitive testing completed, um, imaging studies beforehand. So you're really doing a lot of prep work prior to getting into the OR to make sure that you have set this patient up for the best possible outcome. Yeah, you're right, it's really incredible. I can take a spine patient or a brain tumor patient and they seem pretty dramatic patients, but we can see them and take them to the operating room the next day. Mm -hmm. But with a deep brain simulation patient, it has to go through neurology vetting, mm -hmm. neurocognitive vetting, MRI scans, then to me, it can take on the fast track something like four to six weeks, and that's if we all work very quickly. Mm -hmm. This is a slow, deliberate process, I think, deliberately, because we want to really measure twice and cut once. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a slide that I have here that I think will highlight the fact that this is definitely surgery. And uh, there's a cute little cartoon on the left that shows little dots uh, that seem to be going into the head and then a little pacemaker type of device that's uh, on the chest. And then the middle slide shows a little bit more dramatically that there's a, a wire that's in your head. And I want people to realize that this is surgery. And those wires stay there and they will give you that uh, relief. And 
How do you discuss with patients, I know how I do, but how do you discuss with patients and broach the topic of you may need brain surgery? So I try and qualify it based on what their perception of brain surgery is. And I tell them that while this is brain surgery, as far as brain surgery goes, it's fairly minimally invasive. Yeah, um, they're not removing your skull. Uh, they're not you know, digging down deep into the tissue of the brain. It's very targeted, very direct. Yeah. And um, when I use the euphemism windows instead of holes, so I'll say through two windows mm -hmm. about the size of nickels in your skull, um, they'll insert a filament about the size of angel hair pasta mm -hmm. and just as flimsy. So they get the idea of scale in size of what this is, um, that it's all internal and that it's tunneled just under the skin and that the pulse generator or the pacer battery also uh, uh, sits under the skin uh, so that they, they might feel it when they are turning from side to side, um, but it's not something that's painful or uncomfortable uh, and that it's something that can, once hair grows back and everything is, is in place, can easily be hidden and quite inconspicuous. Yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the point about hair because I think that that's uh, that sure. that that is uh, that's something that's real. Mm -hmm. This is another slide that's showing what's happening in the operating room. And again, the operating room in a deep brain simulation case is one that's full of toys. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say toys, it actually means technology, and it means that te technology gets supported by a whole bunch of people. So it's a fairly busy, crowded space where we have real-time electrophysiology. We have the patients awake for as scary as that might sound. It's actually quite gratifying to the patients. We have a team of folks that are always keeping the patients calm and occupied and uh, engaged. And then you talked about those uh, sort of pasta uh, strands. We've got wires that are listening to various parts of the brain that we'll talk about later. But I do want to get to the point that you said once the hair grows back, indeed, your hair, you will be, your, it's neurosurgery and you will be getting a haircut. And part of that is because we're placing something that's going to be a permanent implant and we don't want any kind of contamination to that. I'll show you a picture later at how great hair grows back. I mean, if I got that haircut, I don't think my hair would grow <laughs> back. So that's, that's neither here nor there. But I think that I've seen everyone super happy with what they get, wouldn't you say? I agree completely. And to give them a, a period of time, I say that after the surgery is done, um, it, we let the brain heal and we wait about four to six weeks to come and see me to do yeah. the initial programming. And by the time I see my patients back in the office, their hair has already started to yeah. grow um, to a considerable amount. So it lets them know that it's not, they're not going to be bald for an indefinite extended period of time. And then would you say that, uh, have you had anyone that's really, uh, I, I can't say that I have, but have you had anyone that's really regretted the surgery? No, yeah. mm -mm, not at all. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think so. I think that's what we really also have to focus on, that surgery sounds scary, right. and surgery on your brain sounds even scarier, mm -hmm. and in particular when you have medication options. Right. But I have to say that sometimes, I don't know, I'm a surgeon and I feel that we can do this safely, and you're an advocate, and I know that you feel that we can do this safely, but we have to get break that barrier to let patients know that sometimes medicine is not the best. Right. And, and how do you feel about that? I, I agree completely. And I also think what we were talking about before with managing expectations is extremely yeah. important because oh, okay. I will say that nobody has regretted the surgery. Have there been patients that have questioned like, is this, did I do the right thing? Is it as good as it could have been? The answer is still yes, because we do the surgery for particular purposes, whether it's tremor reduction, whether it's medication reduction, whether it's to control the side effects of medication if patients have had the disease for quite some time and they're very dyskinetic. And the disease still progresses under Absolutely. the surgery. Um, yeah. They will still need to work on their balance. They will still need to work on their speech. They will still need to be an active participant in their care. It's not just set it and forget it. Yeah. Um, and so when sometimes they get a little down because there's still work to do, I explain to them, I'm like, but look at your tremor. Is your Absolutely. tremor better? Yes, well, that was the reason for doing the surgery. We still have to work on all of this other stuff. And. When patients ask about surgery, I've got another slide here that sort of shows, uh, not sort of, but does show what we do at uh, Global Neuroscience. 
you probably trained at a point in time and maybe you even went into the OR where patients' heads were placed into these uh, awful torture device yes. looking, uh, that was the what we call- part they would say. Right. Yep. That, that there were these <laughs> frames that would, because what we do to the head is we turn it into sort of like a three-dimensional battleship game, like B-27, and that's where we want to go. And that device was useful for that. But in this slide over here, one thing that we've used is we've used basically GPS technology. We literally use these five millimeter screws. They go into the skull and they create a registration that allows us to create a platform. And so when patients are in the operating room with us, they can move their heads, they can look from side to side. They can feel as normal as being awake in an operating room can be. Are they awake for this part of the surgery or asleep for this part? Uh, it depends. Uh, when we do younger kids, like the youngest child that we did was uh, eight years old and uh, for her we kept her awake but we gave her a little puppy dog mm -hmm. to be preoccupied with. But we had another uh, six-year-old that we put to sleep. Uh, not put to sleep, we put her to under <laughs> anesthesia uh, uh, to, to keep her calm. But all of our adults seem quite sanguine with this. We numb up their heads. Yeah. Uh, it's just think of it as a, I don't have any piercings, but think of it as a very um, radical piercing. Yes. yes. And they always ask, well, if I'm awake, will it be painful? And I tell them no, because the, does the scalp and the area of the head is completely numbed right. and the brain itself, as you've heard in multiple conversations over this conference, doesn't have. Pain, uh, the nerve endings for the pain fibers. That's right, and so much of this case, uh, for me at least, happens in conjunction with you, and that is that, as this slide will show, what we're doing is we're really creating a one-of-a-kind, patient-specific mm -hmm. targeting device that will either take us to places where uh, we feel that their, uh, say, drug uh, needs will be uh, decreased or their cognitive impairments will be less. We really, I think, are discussing back and forth in our multidisciplinary uh, movement disorder conferences, where is the best site? Uh, so I think that all of our patients can be reassured that there are at least uh, four or five people mm -hmm. weighing in as to where to go. Um, and I think that that's a critical thing. It's it not just you, it's not just me, uh, it's a lot of people checking and checking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now, I think what I'd like to do, and this might be a little bit tr trickier, uh, is this slide shows what it's going to sound like if you're in the operating room. And I'd like you to keep in mind that we know where you tell us we should go, and I know where that is in the brain. But every brain is just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a little bit... Um, egoistic or uh, godlike to imagine that I know exactly where to go mm -hmm. just based on imaging. And so I use electrophysiology as feedback. Mm -hmm. And that really tells me uh, in a way, so uh, for instance, when you're in China, sp people speak one language. And in Italy, they speak another language. Different parts of the brain, like different parts of the globe, have different languages. And we're looking for the language of in particular, for instance, the subthalamic nucleus to tell us that we're where we want to be. Uh, and let's see if we can play this. Right now, perfect. This is a part of the brain that has these sort of cells which are called burster cells. And again, it's just part of an anatomy, it's part of a drive, it's part of my GPS map that's electrophysiologically getting me to a site. And then as we go a little bit further into the brain, we hear this other Type of noise. I don't know, were you ever in the operating was, room for that? Hello. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our neurologists do this, sometimes we have just a high-tech specialty company that does this. Uh, in uh, w whatever iteration it's done, I think this is critical. Absolutely. Not doing this, I think, is a little bit egoistic because I think the time to change or make any uh, adjustments is in the operating room. It's not to let you have to deal with, say, something that I just wanted to get through. Mm -hmm. And as we get even closer, we sort of hear certain very characteristic noises that make us feel really comfortable. And then when we are really there, and I don't know if uh, the audience can sort of appreciate this, but I know, Jill, you can, mm -hmm. there's almost like a, a, a rhythmicity mm -hmm. to the noise yeah. of the electricity, yep. exactly. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that that's what's driving the tremor, yeah. exactly. So I think that I'd really like to stress that we do so many things at uh, GNI from preoperative mm -hmm. 
to intraoperative to make sure that you have the opportunity to give our patients the best possible outcome. And I appreciate that because <laughs> there is there's a million combinations of programming that I can do. Yeah. But the reality is when electrodes are placed in the appropriate way, the programming is fairly simple. It has to get nuanced and tricky and uh, very uh, fancy, if you will, when I'm trying to program around a poorly placed lead. Mm -hmm. um, but when all of the steps are done appropriately and the target is hit, uh, then my job as programmer um, to elicit the uh, improvement of symptoms that the patient wants is, is fairly straightforward. Uh, and that's part of the, my conversation with the patients as well about talking to them about surgery. I say that we, we, it's a three-point check. So yeah. we do it by sight, sound, yeah. and not being asleep. And yeah. I think all of these is extremely important by sight. You know, their brain is mapped uh, compared with their MRI compared to what Atlas would be, the sound we just heard, and then the uh, improvement of symptoms based on what they are going in for the DBS4 can be modulated while they're awake in, yeah, the, in the operating 100%. room. Mm -hmm. What do you uh, think, uh, we'll probably have a lot of people in the audience wondering, well, uh, what would not be a reason for me to have DBS? Sure. Uh, excellent question because again we want to set people up for the best possible Absolutely. outcome. Uh, patients that don't get that response to medication, um, tremor predominant set aside because that's sort of a, a unique situation, but uh, a run-of-the-mill Parkinson's patient that just never got that robust response or uh, is moving along quicker in their symptom uh, progression than you would expect. So while DBS should be done early, it's still recommended that it's not done the absolute first thing. Okay. You should have you know, a history of about three years or so under Absolutely. your belt so you can yeah. see how the clinical symptoms are, are, are progressing and what the trajectory will be. Um, Patients that, remember I said there were sort of three main categories of Parkinson's, that postural instability gait predominant person where falls and balance is a big issue not someone that you're typically recommending for DBS because we do know that there is the potential for those symptoms to be worsened right. um, after DBS. Uh, patients that have significant cognitive impairment. Sure. Now, dementia is not a, uh, a, a strict stopping point saying that it can't be considered, but it has to be looked upon in the context of other things. Um, if some mild cognitive impairment with a good caregiver support and everything can be like looked and work around, and that's where our neuropsychology colleagues come into play Absolutely. to kind of give us a, um, a, a barometer. But if someone has profound cognitive impairment or is looking like they're trending that way, it's not a good idea. Um, and then... You know, I will point out with the cognitive part, uh, I think that there are some things that can be done for that. Absolutely. And both you and our uh, neurocognitive colleagues will let us know. Mm -hmm. And then what I'll do is I'll just, instead, Parkinson's is generally a symmetric disease. Mm -hmm. And so typically we're talking about two electrodes in the brain. And one electrode uh, will take care of symptoms on one side of the brain, or body on the other electrode will take care of symptoms on the other side of the body. Mm -hmm. But if somebody has a neurocognitive impairment, we might just do one procedure and then wait for three months mm -hmm. and then do a follow-up procedure. Mm -hmm. And I think that we should let people know that even if there are some, say, mild prohibitions, we will move with the greatest amount of caution but also the greatest amount of sort of aggressiveness for the therapy to give them a benefit. Absolutely, um, completely. It's the staged procedure can be really helpful in yeah. those uh, sorts of scenarios. Um, and then for patients that just, again, never really got a response to medication, yeah, sure. it's, that's pretty much our biggest, our biggest red flag to say, I don't know if this is something that's worth uh, pursuing in this case. Because I think there's nothing worse than a patient having undergone the, the hurdles mm -hmm. that it takes to get to yeah. uh, DBS surgery and then come out on the other end and just say that, well, why did I do this? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's what you pointed out too. It's all about patient selection. Absolutely. And do you feel that, um, how do you feel you broach that topic about getting patients from the medication phase to then a phase where... Mm -hmm you are contemplating surgery. So my approach is to 
lay all the cards on the table for the patient sure. from the beginning. Um, and I do that to kind of destigmatize the idea of surgery um, yeah. early on, because you know, the more you talk about it, the, the less foreign the and less scared, the more familiar it yeah, becomes. Absolutely. So when, if I'm seeing a new patient or somebody who's newly diagnosed mm -hmm. um, and we're talking, I'll, I'll let them know these are our medication options um, based on your symptoms and how you respond. There are surgical options for Parkinson's that are available. While we're doing all of this, we uh, you know have to keep up with the rehab options and the physical therapies and the occupational and speech therapies and all of that. So I very much put it as on equal footing with everything else that is available to them. Um, just so that they're aware that this is not something that's reserved for the worst of the worst yeah, or until yeah. things are, are so terribly bad. Because as we've seen with a lot of interventions for Parkinson's disease, the sooner you do it, the better you can expect an outcome to be. So I'll lay that out from the beginning. Now, if I see someone who's coming to see me for a second opinion, sure. I might actually, and they have never been told about DBS or have been told that they wouldn't be a candidate for DBS, I spend a large portion portion of that visit if they truly are an appropriate candidate re-educating them. Yeah. Not to expect them to at the end of the visit to say, yes, I'm ready to go, but to kind of re- train their brain, if you will, into thinking about what the other options might be for them because we are, we're going to run up against a wall of what our meds can do. Um, and if sometimes, not that you ever want to frighten or scare or you know diminish hope for patients in some way but you want to be realistic and let them know that there are limitations to what we can accomplish that if we stick with just medications for their particular flavor of parkinson's they might not be getting the best overall result that they could um, and if we if they have been told for whatever reason that they were not a good candidate in the past we can unpackage that and explain Absolutely. why and uh, re-educate that they might very well be and it might be something to consider you know I think you hit on two really really important points there and one point that you hit on was that at some point in time back in say 1997 when deep brain simulation first uh, emerged as a FDA approved therapy I think everyone was apprehensive about surgery and it was really truly reserved for some of the worst patients. But it shouldn't be surprising then that if you are such a debilitated patient, that no matter what's done, whether it's some random change or, or a wild change of medications or something as dramatic as deep brain stimulation surgery doesn't help you, it shouldn't be so surprising. I think both what you do and what I do is to go out to that community of movement disorder folks, whether it's Parkinson's, essential tremor, dystonia, and try to tell them that we're trying to optimize quality of life while they have it mm -hmm. so they can go on with their lives. Isn't it, would you agree I, with that? I, say, I kind of say it's resetting the clock. Yeah. Um, and that there's, you know, a rule of sevens or tens, if you will, that like for the first seven to ten years, you're uh, muddling along, doing well, yeah. minor medication changes, but then that therapeutic window starts to narrow and narrow and narrow, yeah. and then you consider the surgery. But my goal is not to necessarily wait to the ten-year mark at this point, yeah. but that was traditionally how we had looked sure. at it. But it's the idea of resetting the clock because if you are able to give them a therapeutic benefit, yeah. reduce their meds. Since we know the disease progresses underneath, we can yes. then reintroduce meds at a lower at a lower dose so that they tolerate it better in the future. I think that uh, something that I like to tell patients is that you're only as healthy as you are today. Mm -hmm. And in time, not trying to scare them, right. but in time, uh, we don't know how your heart will be, how your lungs will be, how your kidney will be. And if you have some vitality now and you've had a diagnosis by a movement disorder uh, neurologist and you've probably had your Parkinson's for somewhere at least from three to five years, mm -hmm. I think surgery should be part of that discussion. It doesn't mean that it's an absolute, right. but I do feel that it shouldn't be a scary sort of thing like, uh, oh, you are bad, you're getting surgery. Yeah. Uh, it, there's not one flew over, over the cuckoo's no, nest here. Exactly. It is actually mm -hmm. something that we can do. And I think that one thing that I've found, and you probably uh, second me on this, the Parkinson's patients are just so profoundly informed. They are. I mean, they are usually the ones that mm -hmm. are looking for this, or they're mm -hmm. asking their physicians, yep. why can't I have this? Mm -hmm. How do you 
reach those folks because many people with Parkinson's are actually not even being followed by a movement disorder neurologist. Uh, not to their discredit, but there is just a wide number of Parkinson's patients. Mm -hmm. And many uh, internists and uh, family medicine doctors feel some degree confident sure. as to how to treat them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it's a hurdle, I will yeah. tell you that. Um, and then in my approach, there's twofold. I try to, you know, not just educate colleagues, but I also try to educate patients. Yeah. Um, and the route to the patient is a lot easier um, than it is to, you know, getting into uh, changing clinical practice and of stuff course. like that. Yeah, sure. So that's why through programs like this, if, if you remember nothing from this conversation, okay. it's just <laughs> to have the ability to think about DBS sooner rather than later. Like that's Absolutely. it, just, it's not, a, it's not a treatment of last resort. But for the patients, it's uh, a lot through patient support groups and through different um, uh, avenues working with industry. Um, technology is changing in the DBS market. Absolutely. So as of right now, it's sort of having a bit of a, of a resurgence in, in, in popular opinion and discussion because there are more companies now that are. are doing the devices and the technologies within the devices are changing to you know allow more uh, pointed directional uh, electrical stimulation to closed loop programming, which yep. means that they're able to kind of anticipate what the brain might be doing uh, in order to preempt uh, a change for the better as opposed to reacting to it in some way. Uh, so that those companies are also marketing to, to patients and, and to physicians. So we are able to get to build upon that when they come in to talk to us about it. I know that our session is really focused on Parkinson's disease, but there are uh, essential tremors, actually yes. a more predominant tremor. Mm -hmm. Uh, somehow, however, I think it doesn't get uh, brought to surgery as much because people sort of self-medicate themselves. Mm -hmm. There are not the other neurocognitive associated effects. It's not as a holistic problem that's affecting the person. But I would have to say that essential tremor what what are your thoughts on that? Since we have a question about sure. essential tremor, no, it, it's a really great question, and and I don't know why I don't see as many of these patients through no. my particular clinic. Um, I, I don't know if they they just live with it, like they find mm -hmm. different hacks to, to deal with it and um, it, it's a uh, something that has become part of their, their life and their workaround and, and they just make it work where I only see the essential tremor patients that are so profoundly yeah. bad that it, it, it impacts their ability to eat, their ability to, to bathe, their ability to do any kind of activity of daily living. Um, and they have failed the medications because we don't have a specific medication for essential tremor. Um, so they've tried, you know, the propranolols and the, and the mycelines and the primidones and, and all of that, uh, and then some second line stuff. The, and, and usually they don't have a lot of effect. They don't have a lot of effect. It's like, or, it's like or, 50, or the side effects are just yes. things that they the patients don't enjoy. And then they sometimes uh, as like a stopgap before considering surgery, we might even try toxin injections to dampen sure. down the effect yeah. of the tremor. But really, when when an essential tremor patient is coming to me um, in, in a subspecialty clinic, they're actually looking for the the Absolutely. surgical intervention. But I don't necessarily see the ones leading up to that point. Yeah, yeah. And, but I, I agree with you. I think that uh, unlike Parkinson's, which is a, a very nuanced approach, because I don't know whether they're maxed out on their Cinemet or if they have enough Artane or, mm -hmm. or whatever is going on. But with essential tremor, I feel that if you have it and it's dysfunctional, mm -hmm. I think those folks going to surgery, there, there's almost no reason why they shouldn't. Right. And I think that those are also folks that then have an incredible opportunity for then just getting their lives back. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you talk about some of the social isolation that you feel that our movement disorder patients experience? Sure. Uh, I mean, it's embarrassing. Yeah. It's embarrassing to be out in a crowd of people or even just with your family at home sure. and not be able to control uh, the food on your fork or your spoon or to be able to get it up to your mouth without having any um, uh, dribble all over all over your clothes. Uh, not to be if you're out and about and you're fumbling for for car keys yeah. or you're fumbling in your pocketbook or your pocket for something. It it's visible, and when it's visible, it's obvious, and that is something that can shroud people in 
being uncomfortable and not and trying to hide it. How many times do we hear patients, oh, I'll, I'll sit on my hand or I'll keep my hand in my pocket and um, I, I, I try to get in and out of places as quickly as possible. So it's a very real and valid concern. So when we're talking to patients about how it impacts their daily activities, it's not just the physical activities, it's the social activities as well. And they'll say, well, I don't know if it's bad enough. And I'll say to them, I'm like, it, it's patient dependent. If you are here and you're telling me that it's preventing you from doing things, yeah. but you don't know if it's quote unquote bad enough because you're still able to do them, then I'm here to tell you that it's bad enough to consider doing something about. Absolutely. Yeah. You're right, the patients when they probably come to you and just like when they come to me, they'll hold their hands mm -hmm. because they'll hold the tremor, they'll put their hands in their pocket, anything to do to sort of hide that. But then uh, sort of so many patients will tell me that I haven't been to a restaurant right. in five years mm -hmm. because there's no fun in having the soup fly all over their mm -hmm. uh, other patrons. Uh, so I think that there is a sense of depression that sort of seeps in. There's mm -hmm. a sense of social isolation. Of course, now with COVID, we're all socially mm -hmm. isolated. But I think that in particular with this disease, there is that deep risk. Uh, what do you see as these sort of comorbidities in your patients in your movement disorder clinic? Um, everything that you had mentioned, it's different for Parkinson's versus essential course, tremor, sure. but the comorbidities for Parkinson's disease, there's a whole host of what we call non-motor symptoms. and. It should be said that these are not things that we typically look to do DBS for, yeah. but if it is, if they, nothing happens in isolation. So if it's part of a cyclical process that they are more anxious or more depressed because of their tremor, and when they're more anxious and more depressed, their tremor becomes worse. Sure. If we can yeah. help the tremor in some way, will it then in a roundabout way help the anxiety and depression? Possibly, we never make a claim that it will, but it, but explaining how you cannot disentangle mood and motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease is extremely important. Um, so I would say that you know, depression, anxiety, sleep problems mm -hmm. are huge in Parkinson's yeah. disease. And uh, again, this isn't a sleep aid, but if they can get, if they can be less rigid for those akinetic rigid patients and turn over more fluidly in bed because this is running for 24 hours, then they may in fact have um, an improved sleep quality. Uh, so we, we look to extrapolate what the other potential benefits may be. Again, when managing expectations, we let them know that we're doing it for one or two particular things. But as with medications as well, any intervention, when you're feeling better, you're doing better. Right. So um, there might be some added ancillary benefits. I think you're right about that. And I, I think you probably, you actually did uh, touch on this earlier, but it's funny because I think patients think of surgery as a definitive, okay, I had my surgery, sort of like I had my kitchen renovated, it's ready to go. But now they have a new body. Yeah. And so how do you get them to uh, now understand their reanimated selves? Of uh, therapy, 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 and not yeah. psychotherapy, but <laughs> physical, ther physical therapy and occupational therapy and all of yeah. those good things. So sure. again, the second takeaway from this talk, uh, uh, big and loud therapy for Parkinson's sure. disease. It yeah. is, if we feel like we need to tune up a patient before surgery, we'll send them. We absolutely will send them afterwards mm -hmm. if they are, are, again, needing that feeling of reanimation. Like I, I'm moving more fluidly, but I kind of feel a little bit more off balance because of it. Yeah. So let's retrain your body's position in space. Um, get you, you know, again, used to the, the, to the uh, input, the sensory input that you have to reprocess and, and make you feel a little bit more, more secure and stable. Same thing for speech. Balance, speech, uh, dexterity, fluidity are all part and parcel of Parkinson's, Absolutely. whether you get DBS yeah. or not. Sure. So the way that we help modulate it with DBS, without DBS, is the therapies, but absolutely with DBS, we have patients um, participate in them. And if they feel that they don't need the therapy because it's, it's a little too sterile, um, there's a whole host of just very focused exercise classes that yeah. build upon those same retraining strategies, rock steady boxing, dance for PD, yoga for PD, whatever it might be, but that's really how, we, um, how I approach it. And I let patients know, again, the conversation and the managing expectations. Like, we're gonna get our surgery, but there's still gonna be work to do. Absolutely. And I'm going to be recommending and sending you for this um, after surgery as well. And sometimes, it's not that it's a deal breaker, but it's part of the conversation, because if I don't necessarily get the buy-in from the patient that You're they're right. willing to do it, then I might say, you know what, then this might not be the right time for you to go for the surgery. 
you're right. It's not just that it's done and then now you can just go drive your new car. Right. <laughs> it's it's done, but now the onus is on that patient mm -hmm. to then optimize their therapy Absolutely. and get them to the point that they want to be. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a really important point to uh, make. Can you tell me, because I don't see it as much, what are the nuances that go on with the programming? So in the operating room, my uh, sort of promise to the patient and my promise to you as a partner is that I'll give you the best location mm -hmm. and the safest location for the greatest amount of efficacy. But that's just in the operating room. That's not seeing the patient in all 360 degree spheres of their lives. Mm -hmm. When they come to you, now they've, their hair's grown back, they've, uh, they're not in this funny hospital gown, uh, they don't have some things on their heads they're now the person that they want to be, but how do you get them to uh, mm -hmm. readjust and, and what is the programming uh, parameters? So there are a couple of different ways to approach programming yeah. and some of that has to do with uh, what the patient feels comfortable with, stamina, things like that. So traditionally, from when I was a fellow, we would see a patient for sort of a marathon session, first mm -hmm. time out after uh, the surgery was done for something called a monopolar review where there's four, sure. there's four contacts on the lead. Um, you test each contact point with some different variables. The variables that I adjust are uh, uh, milliamps or voltage, uh, hertz and uh, pulse width. And so we keep the hertz and pulse width the same and we usually just ch change the milliamps or the voltage. Yeah. And then we pick one or two particular symptoms let's say tremor, because it's yeah. the obvious one, sure. um, and we'll see how that tremor responds at different lead. To do a full monopolar review can take over an hour, yeah. and sometimes that's just not practical to do, but it's helpful to gather the information of where they are. Uh, so again, reading the room of the patient in front of you, I'll let them know that this is gonna be a longer visit, but we'll see how you're feeling, we'll see how you're doing, but through experience, I can kind of speed up that process to sure. know where I'm going. Um, because in fact, when you talk about this, there are four contacts. Mm -hmm. On each side. <laughs> on each side. Yep. And their disease is not symmetric. Right. And not only that, within those four contacts, you can have multiple combinations. Okay. And then you can have all the things that you talked about, a sort of voltage, a frequency, and a duration. And there are literally millions mm -hmm. of combinations. But not to scare folks, you now have that sort of uh, facility that you mm -hmm. can probably, with just a little bit of fussing, mm -hmm. figure out how to program somebody, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, and I let them know, like, we, we might not necessarily get optimal improvement off the first programming session that we do, and we don't expect to, and yeah. for the first few months after, program, after the DBS surgery, I'll see them back in the office more routinely than I would for a regular follow-up. Sure. So maybe as frequently as once a month or every six weeks, just to yeah. do a little bit of these tweaks and changes. Uh, but then after we find a sweet spot, um, we can go back to the, you know, every three months, every four months follow-up yeah. that we would normally do. and. Oh, the other purpose of seeing patients back so frequently early on is to get them comfortable with their own device because sure. all of these devices have the ability to be adjusted at home by the patient. Some patients are do very you, standoff. Do, you, do. Okay. Not, at the, not at the very first <laughs> right. one or two, but after a couple of sessions I will because I don't want them to fear it. I yeah, want them to right. know sure. that they yeah. have the the power. Yeah, give them their autonomy. The, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. To be able to adjust Fantastic. it. And yeah. it's even after I do that, some patients are like, Doc, I'm never touching it. It's only going to be you, and I, I don't mind seeing you. I'll come as frequently as you want. Other people are tinkerers, and yeah. they will adjust it to a point where we have to have a conversation of like, you, got, you can't do it that frequently. You, you, you got to give yourself time to, to assimilate to the new programming. But um, So there's, op, there's you know, a spectrum of patients. But most people will uh, like the ability to know that they, have the, the, they can either go up or go down on their stimulation, yeah, switch I to a different so. group for a different type of... Uh, effect if they're looking to improve one particular thing. And so that's another reason for the more frequent sessions in the beginning so that they can get used to adjusting their patient programmer. Well, there are two things uh, that you said, and I think one is implied and the other was uh, very specific. One is that you're probably also, because I tell this to the patients, you're going down on your pharmacologic oh, yes, therapy mm -hmm. and we're increasing your electrophysiologic therapy. Mm -hmm. So there's always that fussing for the... I, tend to tell them for the first 
two to three to four, even up to six months, yeah. where you're going to find them in what you said, their sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Is that about yeah. fair? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then I'm just wondering now with the way that we're doing telemedicine, how do you incorporate that into your movement disorder population or can you, or is this something too nuanced that you, you have to see them? So I, yes and no. Um, obviously for the early part of the programming, sure. I have yeah. to see them because I can't do that remotely. Yeah. Um, but if we are, you know, doing not making adjustments at every visit or having a more routine follow-up despite them having dbs and they have the ability to adjust their programming at home yeah. i can walk them through making adjustments via telemedicine i can absolutely adjust medications via telemedicine sure. only if i have to add a new program or a new setting into their um into their device do i have to physically see them in the office now you mentioned adding a new program and i think that's interesting as well because I had a patient where we could get his uh, motor symptoms just absolutely perfect, mm -hmm. but then his vocalization was just a little bit off. Mm -hmm. And at times when he would then have to make a presentation, then he could just switch absolutely. to where he had a more optimal vocalization. Mm -hmm. uh, so how, have you seen that with your patients and absolutely. how do you like to? Yeah, I let them know that. We look for one overall programming uh, like parameter, a happy place, a happy yeah. place that yeah. it might not be quote unquote perfect, but yes. it is really close to getting yeah. you to this place yeah. where you need to be. But then if you have, if you really need something finessed or nuanced, say you're a, a, a musician and you really need like good finger dexterity Absolutely. for yeah. a guitar, um, or uh, I had a, a, a patient who was an anesthesiologist and we wanted to make sure that when he was intubating that the tremor Did was... You want to intubate somebody? <laughs> <while> <laughs> <they're okay. laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, but that's the other thing I do do in the office. I have patients mimic their their motions that we're trying to, to like improve. that anesthesiologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, um, but yeah, so there are particular particular groups that you can really focus on one particular symptom, but sometimes you do that to the, uh, you know, to the decrement of something else, whether it's speech or something like that. Um, but yeah, and it's all about, again, giving, laying out the possibilities of what the potential for the devices are and uh, so that they know what could potentially be, uh, be improved um, and, and to what degree. You know, this is probably really not even the forum, but I just felt that I should uh, take this time to get your thoughts on it because I know what mine are. But so many people ask me about stem cell therapy. Mm -hmm. And so many people ask me about going to Austria or Mexico or Australia. I don't want to sound like a naysayer, but what do you tell those patients? Uh, I say that it is nowhere near ready for yeah. clinical use. Um, it is, it's an active area of research um, and not necessarily, uh, it, it's an active area of early phase research is yeah. what I say. Um, uh, and it's something that kind of comes and goes in its popularity and we are kind of seeing a resurgence in it again. Uh, but it is, if that was something to ever be explored or considered for patients, only look through reputable trials and definitely no place that's offering it as a therapy at the moment. Yeah, yeah. No, not doing that medical tourism. I yeah. tell folks that if you want the leading edge, cutting best therapy, it's deep brain stimulation. Right. Mm -hmm. And even though this might be a therapy that we've had in place for about 23 years mm -hmm. uh, from the FDA, at least in this country, there are changes to the therapy that you alluded to mm -hmm. where we can actually fine tune the electrical therapy that we're delivering. And you made this uh, comment about open loop versus, cl uh, I think you said closed loop or open loop. What our patients should understand is that even though you're sort of, I, I think of it not as a light switch, as you said, but it's more like a dimmer switch. Mm -hmm. And you're really looking for what's going to set the mood. But not only there, there are ways of almost having like a feedback loop, which I think that's the most exciting thing about mm -hmm. uh, deep brain stimulation therapy right now, where we're trying to understand what particular brain frequencies and brain bandwidths mm -hmm. are things that can show us that we're getting an effect 
or maybe that we're losing an effect. I mean, I know we're probably not really even using that yet, but I, I still want to point out that DBS is the cutting edge of therapy and the ancillary things that are coming out of it are what are making it so cutting edge. It's true. When patients come to see you, has anybody asked about focused ultrasound in comparison to DBS? So, you know, I, uh, so focused ultrasound for whatever reason seems to be the flavor of the month. Yeah. And I will tell you that, uh, and I don't know if any of the uh, folks in the audience are aware of this, but DBS was an accident. And I'm sure you know this very well, but there was a fellow in France, uh, Alim Benabid, and what would always happen is that they would lesion mm -hmm. uh, because they would cause a lesion and we would call, uh, and, and that's why we would call it an ablative therapy to take away. Uh, but what they would always do before they would lesion is that they would stimulate to see if they were causing any side effects. And the stimulation at one point in time was set too high and they got the therapeutic effect and they said, well, why should we destroy tissue? So DBS is considered neuro-restorative because it doesn't destroy tissue. All the other therapies are ablative and high frequency or high focused ultrasound is ablative. It's providing energy to the brain and it's taking out a part of the brain that is part of this motor loop. I think it's a step backwards. Mm -hmm. And I don't, maybe you can offer it to patients and say, well, you don't have to have all these wires and things, but you know what, those wires and things are telling us information. Mm -hmm. And I think that while it sounds like there are newer therapies, and I'm not in, a, I'm not in opposition to those therapies, mm -hmm those therapies don't give you the ability to control patients with that fine tuning of nuance of electricity and pharmacology. Let's be honest, the currency of the brain is electricity. Mm -hmm. So why shouldn't a little bit of electricity in the right spot produce magic? And so I, I don't, I'm, as, as a brain surgeon, I'm against anything that destroys brain. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's what I would tell you about high frequency <laughs> ultrasound. Uh, you had mentioned uh, neurorestorative, and there was a question as does DBS slow progression of uh, PD? And yeah. I would say no, we don't have anything that slows the progression of Parkinson's disease. That's where pharmacologically the next wave of research is looking, borrowing meds from uh, other conditions like cancer, looking right. at uh, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and then there are a lot of uh, therapies and trial for um, uh, gene therapy and uh, different uh, autoimmune uh, um, uh, therapies as well. But as of right now, we cannot make any claim that any intervention, pharmacologic or uh, surgical, can slow the progression. But you know what, I think that's a really good point because I think some people get hung up on that. And I don't mean to be, uh, say, hung up like it's a derogative, but mm -hmm. if you have high blood pressure, well, you take a medication for your high blood pressure, but you haven't cured your high blood pressure. Right. You're just ameliorating the symptoms. Right. And I think that that's, again, what people should realize that deep brain stimulation offers a way of decreasing symptoms, maybe maximizing uh, your sort of uh, quality of life mm -hmm. by a lot, usually. And we're not trying to make a claim that we've cured you of your Parkinson's, mm -hmm. but we're making the claim that you have Parkinson's, so live with your Parkinson's, right. but live vibrantly. Absolutely. Don't you think? A hundred percent. And I think, again, as we're kind of coming to a close in a little bit, one of the things uh, to think about is if you're just thinking about this or if you think your patient might be a potential candidate for yeah. DBS, the worst that could happen if a referral or a discussion is made is that they're not. That's but right. it's it, exactly to what you said. If you have the ability to help with quality of life and, and improve symptoms so that they can... I explain to patients that while Parkinson's is a degenerative condition, I think of it more as a chronic one. It is. Because it spans decades. Yes. and. That's a long time. So uh, if we can help improve those uh, symptoms for those patients for the long haul, then it's absolutely worth being part of the discussion. Um, and that's a good point you make that it is a chronic condition because you have folks that you probably have known for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to some extent, I rely on, you know, to a great extent, I rely on your uh, intimacy with those patients uh, for trusting them to then come see me. And so I think that patients should really understand that uh, while there are probably some cowboys out there that just want to put electrodes in people's brains and see uh, whether they work or not, 
I think the best programs happen when there is a, a sense of uh, engagement between neurology and neurosurgery, and that's, I think, where we're really, really lucky at uh, GNI. In most, in most institutions, neurology is a department and neurosurgery is a department, and they both think that each other are idiots and whatever, <laughs> and they always fight with each other. Uh, you have to see that patient. No, you have to see it. But I think here we have this beautiful sort of uh, uh, lack of pillars, barriers, uh, um, silos, and we're able to see patients whether they need neurocognitive testing, whether they need to see somebody for their uh, autonomic dysfunction from their uh, Parkinson's disease, whether they need their meds, or whether they need surgery. So mm -hmm. I, I really want folks to understand yeah. that if you're going to come here, and we hope you come here, and if you send your patients here, that they will be treated in a way of utmost respect and not just be a surgical it does us no favors to have a patient unhappy with their outcome. So no, it we. It does you no favors. It does me. Yeah, I follow up with them. That's right. right. That's right. So. I'm not able to sort of slide away for a moment, <laughs> but you have them for life. I do. So, absolutely. I mean, for not only, you know, because it's the right thing to do, but also self preservation. We're going to make sure that we are uh, considering and, and having this conversation with the appropriate patients. What about uh, sort of say if there's a physician that really enjoys taking care of their Parkinson's patient, do you feel that there's a way of engaging them in uh, the post-operative yeah. care? I, 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 I really do enjoy working collaboratively with a, um, you know, the whole team of patients. And um, I will tell patients, like, you don't need to see two people for the same thing. It's redundant. That's but right. this isn't two things for the same thing. I have the ability to program, but if you are, have been medically well managed and are comfortable and are, have a wonderful relationship with your referring neurologist, there's no reason why um, you have to give up that relationship at all. And I often prefer that because yeah. it's, not, it's not my goal to take over all care. It's if, if, a, if a referral is made specifically for DBS, it's to address that part of things and have that be an addition to everything that they are currently receiving. Um, and it, you know, it wouldn't be stepping on any toes or anything like that. It would be a, a very much a, a cohesive uh, and symbiotic relationship. And again, when other than the frequent follow-ups early on post-operatively, if we have that sweet spot and if patients have their ability to make adjustments and they're doing well, they it doesn't even need to be an every three or four month follow-up. Those are for my patients that I'm managing meds and whatnot too. Sure, um, if I'm just doing programming, it could be once or twice a year. Like, yeah. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we are really running out of time, unfortunately, but uh, I think that this is sort of a, uh, a group effort when we, uh, with regard to the patient and their family. Mm -hmm. How do you help the spouses or the significant others uh, sort of be integrated in the care? Because often there's a lot of, uh, say, apprehension and confusion. A spouse can be very useful and helpful in dealing with some of the technology. So I, luckily most of my patients come in group, in mass. So <laughs> it's, they'll either be there with a, with a family member, with a child, with a spouse, and yeah. so they're just part of the conversation from the beginning. Sure, if, it yeah. is a, if it is a patient that comes by themselves and I think that they could use a little bit help, I'll request that they come, sure. or yeah. if it's a televisit, have a family member present or call in for the next one, because as you said, it's important to get everybody comfortable with the technology, what the technology can do, how to adjust it when necessary, and uh, there's also the support of the company so uh, that's a really good point why don't you speak to that because you have that more in the outpatient yep so uh, the the companies that are uh, providing uh, DBS devices now uh, all have uh, representatives in the field that can uh, have a more direct communication with the patients than say like a pharmaceutical rep can and so if there's questions about what button do I press on my uh, device or I, I don't know if my device is charged and I'm, I'm curious about it you can contact the different companies and those representatives will be able to speak with you and walk you through it as well. So there's multiple layers of support that are available for patients that undergo the procedure. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I think the uh, device companies are absolutely particularly critical to this. So we do have a sort of a tripartite relationship. You know, we are uh, coming to the end really in the last sort of 60 seconds and I'm going to show you a slide that in a way should be a little bit nostalgic for you. Uh, do you remember this gal? I do, I do. Yeah, and you can see that uh, that is her 
in the operating room with a thumbs up, mm -hmm. uh, despite sort of all the uh, things that are swirling around her. And uh, there uh, next to her in the next slide is uh, us doing what I think we're sh we should be doing, which is giving her back her life. Mm -hmm. Her hair's back, she's there, uh, her hair's regrown, she's there for her son's uh, wedding. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's one of the most amazing things that we do, don't you think? Absolutely, absolutely. I'll just make one point uh, about uh, the compatibility of these devices with MRIs. And in general, they are. Yes. Uh, there are some nuances which make them, say, uh, prohibitive on certain things, but typically the manufacturers have those parameters, and so you know that you can still get MRI scans Absolutely. with yeah. these patients. Mm -hmm. We're literally in the last few seconds, and I think we'll just say thank you. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed.